uh, okay, so as you can see today, I'm talking in English. So for my Slovenian listeners, don't be too surprised because I have a very prominent guest, Mr. Charles A. Coulomb. Did I pronounce it correctly, sir? More than most English speakers okay, do. Okay, thank you very much. So we'll be talking in English today. Um, uh, first of all, for my Slovenian speaking uh, listeners, don't be too hard on me uh, on my English. And for my for anyone that will be listening in foreign language, um, I hope the English will be my English will be good enough for you to understand what um, Mr. Uh, Coulomb and I will be talking about, uh, sir. Greetings, laudetur, Thank laudetur you. Jesus. I liked it. So, so, yeah, laudetur Jesus Christus, yeah. uh, forever and in ever. Eternum. Semper yeah, I like I, I like to uh, greet my guests like that because it's Catholic show, anyway. So yeah, yeah. <clears throat> sir, um, you're a prominent author, a stand-up comedian, and a knight. How does that go together? <laughs> well. I haven't been a comedian for many, many years, although people accuse me of never having stopped. <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I, you know, I, I recently had a fellow say to me, uh, why must you make everything into a joke? And I said to him, I don't make everything into a joke. It's just that I don't pretend that things that are ridiculous. When I hear someone prominent say something ridiculous, I will laugh. It's not my mm -hmm. fault. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. As far as uh, as far as the other goes, well, of course, it's the uh, the writing that, uh, much to my surprise, led to the knighthood. But that in itself, um, you know, uh, how do I put it? Knighthood has many different meanings, you know, and as. Uh, as I look at the whole institution as today, you know, there are different things. There are orders of knighthood like the papal orders that are really decorations. Mm -hmm. uh, there are orders like Malta or the Deutsche Orden or uh, uh, the um, uh, Holy Sepulchre that are actual institutions, real orders. And beyond that, there's the concept of knighthood in the abstract. And then beyond that, there is what knighthood always meant, which was the the baptism, in a sense, of the warrior by the church. Mm -hmm. And apropos of nothing in particular, it simply pops into my head right now, but if you look in the uh, Roman Pontificale, before 1960 versions, okay. you'll see an order for the making of a knight, uh, because traditionally there were three sorts of people that could make knights. Okay. Kings kings, bishops, and okay. other knights. Well, it seems to me that the order of the making of a knight is like any other blessing. It gives particular and special graces to that particular job. Mm -hmm. So I've often thought that in, in the current situation, that's something the church might think about reviving, not as a decoration, not as an award, but is a, uh, a means of giving grace to people, say, apologists for the church, mm -hmm. perhaps uh, Catholic military officers and police. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, not, not, you understand, as a reward or a, a, a thing of just of honor, but as a means of getting those chivalric graces to people who need them. As a, as a confirmation of what they were doing till now. And Precisely to, to, right. to keep on doing all the good work they, they do. And to get special graces for he from heaven for that particular job. Of, cur of course, yeah. And, uh, you know, there are, there are a lot of people you could think who might need it during the coronavirus. I mean, you could think of uh, doctors. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's often seemed to me, but especially in recent years and never more than now, that... Uh, knighthood as a um a way of gaining grace for the people who are defending the church and society against their enemies hmm. in whatever field yeah it would would be uh would be a good thing to do but <coughs> we'll see yeah i mean well w when you mentioned coronavirus th my first thought was 
unfortunately not so many priests could get a knighthood like that in these times. Well, they wouldn't need it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's true. I mean, on my on my own show a couple of days ago, um, my uh, my uh, permanent uh, interlocutor hmm. uh, asked me if uh, we should talk to the bishops about loosening up on the restrictions on the churches. And I said, well, as far as California goes, don't bother talking to the bishops, talk to the governor. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the bishops are, you know. Now, mind you, that's not true everywhere. Okay. And it's it's important that we bear in mind several different parallel things. Mm. One is there is a great deal of, I think, legitimate disagreement over just how much of this lockdown is needed. Talking regarding the state in United States. Yeah, or in general. To, you know, or in general, I mean, because don't forget, the situation varies wildly from place to place. Okay, it may be just uh, uh, intercession um, for our listeners. So you are American born New Yorker, but are currently living in Austria. Yes. Uh, somewhere near Vienna or? Yeah, in Niederösterreich. Uh, okay, in that region. Um, yeah. So, you know, the situation in both countries or in, in both continents quite good, right? I do, and of course, I've, I've lived most of my life in Los Angeles, although I'm a, a native New Yorker, yeah. and the past uh, two years I've been here. And it's kind of ironic that the two places that... Uh, uh, coronavirus... Uh, here in Austria, we've been under lockdown since uh, March 16th, and um, mm -hmm. you know it, it certainly has done the trick. Um, now, whether or not it would have done the trick anyway, we'll have to look at Sweden to uh, in a few months to know if to know if that was true. But the the point I'm making in all of this is that uh, while I don't. I don't claim to be uh, to know what really should have been done in every place at every time, mm -hmm. and and there is certainly an area for legitimate discussion, shall we say. Um, I think that in those jurisdictions where the church simply has vanished, that's wrong. Okay. Uh, now, whether it's just a question of keeping the churches open as they do here, or having open air masses. A drive by confessions, that kind of thing. That's something people can discuss, I think, legitimately. In Austria, the churches are open? The churches are open, but there are no masses. Okay, so they're open for public, right? They're open, right. So you could go in and basically adore the Blessed Sacrament so long as Perfect. there aren't too many people around. Okay. Uh, and, you know, confessions in danger of death and that kind of thing. But there are some places where there are no confessions or last rites even in danger of death. Well, here in Slovenia, it's like that. Or no baptisms. Well. <laughs> like that wouldn't be necessary, but. Uh, well, uh, my advice, if you live in a, in a jurisdiction where there are no baptisms and you've got a baby born, baptize the kids straight away. Yeah, just do it. As a parent, you yeah. have an obligation. So just. You, you do. Just, and and you can do it, yeah. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, um, in the in uh, Los Angeles, because at the time the requirements were such that kids weren't getting baptized until they were like eight months and things like that or older. Uh, my dad baptized every one of his grandchildren as soon as they were born. <laughs> in other words, my nephews and nieces. Uh, mind you, they had the baptisms later and so forth, the whole public event. But when when you're when you have an impossible thing put on you, you have an obligation to do it yourself. Yeah. It was and like, have you have you maybe read, uh, you know, uh, Bishop Schneider, Athanasius? Yes. yes. Have, you, have you read uh, Christus Vincit? Not yet. I've seen it. I know what it is. But... Yeah. Oh, it's a perfect book. It's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I kind of said it, it's, uh, like sort of a catechism for a 21st century Christian or Catholic, uh, because it's really good. And at one point he says that his parents 
they married sacramentally by themselves they were married so because there was there was no priest possible to be there so uh, oh. as you said you have to do it especially yeah, as a yeah. man it's 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 uh, it's 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 a man <laughs> thing yeah, you have to do it as a knight as a man to do sometimes a man has to do what a man has to do or yeah. uh, that's true and then well i mean you look at japan uh the catholics in japan for like 300 years they only had two sacraments baptism and marriage hmm. because they can do it by themselves yeah and they <laughs> there were no priests so they had uh they each of their communities had two laymen one was the catechizer and the other was the baptizer <laughs> And those, yeah, and that was what they got through with 300 years, and then, uh, and the faith survived that way. Perfect. I mean, that's really a God's blessing, uh, sir. I wanted to ask you something um, regarding. So you're a monarchist, right? It's true. I have Experts this. Experts agree. <laughs> yeah, I, I have this crazy idea, and I think I, I just it has to be said. I has it has to be talked with you. So uh, I don't know what's your stand. Uh, what's your stance on your current president? So, on president of the United States, maybe just a short, so, so a s short opinion. Well, you know, one of the problems is that right now you're expected either to love him or hate him. Okay. Uh, I don't do either one. Well, we're Catholics, so you know, we have setbacks. Yeah. Also regarding the Trump. And uh, the Trump, which is okay, and it's fine by me. But you know that at this point of history, our two nations are connected as I think they will never be ever again. That's quite possibly true. I mean, uh, certainly, it's kind of a funny thing, this lockdown that we're all experiencing. On the one hand, it isolates us uh, into our own countries and in some places even into our own states or provinces or municipalities or whatever mm -hmm. we're living in, on the one hand. But on the other hand, we're all having the same ridiculous experience. I, I say it's ridiculous. I'm not saying the lockdown is wrong. I'm, talk, I'm being purely subjective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. Whether it's right or wrong is a whole other issue. But of course, yeah. Subjectively speaking, we're all going through this nonsense. Okay. And so we're in the odd situation. I mean, you and I are discussing this over a technology that didn't exist when I was young. And I'm in touch with friends across the globe, but I can't go into Vienna. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Now, okay. I was trying to say something else regarding yeah. Melania Trump. Oh, yes. Well, she, oh, I see what you're saying. Yes. Well, okay. she's definitely one of you. You bet. And uh, regarding your stance on mo monarchism. And now I don't know the United States Constitution very well, apart from Fifth and Second Amendment and stuff like that being talked <laughs> yeah. in movies. But, yeah. you know, my idea is Trump, if not among the whole United States, but in some parts, he could become quite a strong figure, maybe a despot. And um, Baron Trump could become the first monarch of those countries. And him being half Slovenian, maybe the first monarch of United <laughs> States or of some countries in United States could be half Slovenian. Well, how that does that story sound? <laughs> Well, you you know that uh, you know that uh, Cleveland, Ohio, is a big Slovenian center. I know, so I know. I I don't know about eighty thousand or something like that, sixty thousand, yeah. something like that, Slovenians. Yeah, I I have a good friend there, Jeanette Coyne. Uh, Coyne's an Irish name. She's not an Irishman, but she's uh, she's Slovenian. Uh, and the the uh, it's it's yeah, that is kind of an interesting thing. But the, the problem the problem with Mr. Trump. Uh, is kind of, in one sense, the problem of the presidency as a whole, which is that even at the best of times, the president, at the end of the day, only has the loyalty of the people who voted for him. Hmm. I mean, he, and he's partly head of government and head of state, but he's also party leader. He is. And there's the old <laughs> joke that a president spends half of his time trying to learn his job, 
and the other half trying to get reelected. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that's that, true. Uh, that produces a lot of problems. Now, today, the United States are divided in very fundamental ways, uh, in a way that I've never seen in my lifetime. Now, mind you, it's happened before. And typically what's happened in American history is that when things get very, very bad, we create a sort of quasi-monarchical figure. So Abraham Lincoln, FDR, that's Franklin Roosevelt. Okay. Uh, and even in a certain sense, almost, uh, President Reagan, who was the only president I ever actually met. Um, that's great. Yeah, it was. But uh, the, there are a lot of, shall we say, inherent contradictions in the presidential office. So these are kind of being made manifest uh, right now. The, the divisions, uh, as I say, you know, you, you're, you're, you're supposed to either hate Trump or love him. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing else, there's nothing in between. I mean, I appreciate several things about him. He certainly has tried to keep more of his campaign promises, uh, including things I wish he wouldn't. But nevertheless, <laughs> he's tried to keep more of his campaign promises than any president I've ever lived under. Uh, he is very attentive. And he's doing wishes. well, I think. Well, he's, he's doing well amongst the people that voted for him. And they got him in, so presumably they'll get him in a second time. Uh, I think that he's been very crafty in terms of dealing with this pandemic because he's left it up to the governors of each state. Hmm. Now, constitutionally, that's what he's supposed to do anyway. But our presidents rarely observe the Constitution if they don't want to. Uh, but in this particular case, he has. What this has done, and but but funded everything from the federal level. So basically, at the end of the day, when this all clears away and we're getting toward November, uh, if people are happy with how they came through the pandemic, hmm. they'll be able to say, well, I supported it, you know, gave you the money. But if they're not, hey, it was your governor's call, not me. <laughs> yeah, it's smart. But yeah. I didn't really want to talk that much about Trump. But the idea of United States or at least some parts of the United States becoming a monarchy, because I myself am a monarchist as well. And uh, I think that's the ultimate form of government, um, especially the Catholic monarchy, which is the, 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 the foundation for me. For me to be a good monarch, you have to be a Catholic monarch, nothing else. Well, for me as well, I, I, wrote, a, I wrote a book called Star Spangled Crown, which was a sort of novel in which our republic collapses and we end up with a monarchy in the United States in the future. And that allowed me to play with a lot of ideas, you see, that uh, you could play with in fiction. It would be difficult to play with them uh, any other way. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there, there, are several, there are several realities that people forget. One of them is that for all of our republican traditions, The foundations of the United States are, in fact, monarchical because we were first settled by primarily by three major kingdoms, mm -hmm. Britain, France and Spain. Mm -hmm. And if you know what you're looking at, the uh, evidence of that monarchical foundation is everywhere. Uh, the second point that's kind of unfortunate is that for a lot of Americans, their love of country, that is their patriotism, is bound up with what people consider the ideology of America. Mm. Is it like sort of a nationalism? Like in a sense. American it, nationalism? or In a sense, uh, it's also called the civic religion of America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We worship ourselves, in a sense. I don't oh, yeah. mean ourselves as in me. I mean the government, the founding fathers, uh, all that stuff. I think that's very American thing. It's like Founding it's very... father, constitution. like Yeah. It is very American, but the problem with it is what happens if faith in it falls? What are you left with? You don't have a love of the country itself, you see. That's the problem. And I've had people say things to me like, well, if America doesn't live up to the American dream, it's worthless. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. America is the country we were born in, our fathers came to and did rather well in. 
uh, it's got kind of a crazy history, but it's our history. And it may not have done invented great works of art, but you know what? We invented the cocktail. We invented <laughs> the Broadway musical and the polio vaccine. Um, no, nah, we did some pretty neat things. They might have been the great. They might not have been the greatest things that ever were. We not. We may not be the shining city on the hill, the last best hope of mankind. But we're ourselves, hmm. and that's that's enough. The third point I covered in the book, though, in uh, apart from the foundations and also trying to come up with a a patriotism that was not dependent upon a dying ideology, the third was a larger question. And this, this question was suggested to me by a Belgian friend of mine, uh, Christophe Buffon de Chosal, who wrote a book called The End of Democracy, which I recommend very highly. Okay, noted. Uh, it's, it's worth reading. It's both available in the original French and in English. But uh, Christophe pointed out to me that there is not in Europe or the rest of the world a single body of Catholic monarchist doctrine per se. Rather, there are a lot of the different ones, Spanish, French, Portuguese, Austrian. Mm -hmm. uh, and the thing is that for adherents of these, it's very difficult for them to see the commonalities because of their own national makeup. Mm -hmm. for, for an American, however, looking at Austria-Hungary, looking at the French legitimists, the Spanish Carlists, the Portuguese, the Miguelists, and on and on and on and on, one could see the commonalities. Yeah, the, it's which, it's easier to for you to to derive something from each and say, well, it's that's monarchy. What yeah. what they could have? Yeah, because we uh, I can look. Anybody in my shoes can look and see what they have in common that's not readily available to them. And. To that end, I would say that uh, Catholic monarchy, traditional Catholic monarchy, um, I'm not talking about liberal monarchies and so forth, um, they basically have four and a half points, as you might say, in common. Uh, the first is, the, well, you'll, you'll see why I say the half point at the end. Uh, the first point is uh, the altar, and that is the place of the church in public life. Mm -hmm. uh, giving legitimacy to the uh, monarchy via the the coronation and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. guiding social life, setting the rules, you might say, um, get, being the animating philosophy of society. And believe me, every society has an animating philosophy. My little joke about separation of church and state is not that it's wrong, but it doesn't exist. Of course it doesn't, and it's not a joke. It's no. a very serious problem. It, well, you see, the question, the question is not, shall we have separation of church and state? The question is, whose church, whose animating philosophy will guide the state? Of course. And, I mean, and that's when we're talking uh, about Catholic monarchy, we kind of just point it out. We want it to be Catholic. It's period. Because somebody has to, I mean, right now, what guides Western governments is this weird, nebulous ideology. Just as communism was the state church in communist days. You know, mm. there, there is no God and Lenin is his prophet. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, you know, in our time, uh, it's this weird, nebulous, I'm okay, you're okay, unless you step out of line and then you'll pay kind of thing. Um, you know, we were discussing before the show the, the idea of modern morality being kind of like a, the madam of a bordello who's outraged that the girls are smoking after work. <laughs> well, it's that kind of thing that dominates us now. And Good. if you step out of line, you will be punished. So, but everyone has its own line. So it's... Uh, to a degree. But the minute you say there are absolutes, suddenly you get smacked. That's oh, the trick. That, well, you what know, you that's good. That's good. Yeah. We have to be prepared. And and our Lord Jesus Christ promises that. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But as I say, so that, that's the first point, the altar. The second, yeah. I would say, is the throne, which is the nature of the monarchy. So what do we got? Well, 
you've got firstly a, uh, a monarch whose legitimacy and whose authority, whose right to govern, comes from God via the church mm -hmm. uh, and from national tradition, which he has to be, in a sense, the incarnation of. Uh, an executive monarchy in the sense that it wouldn't be what people are pleased to call absolute. And this, this makes me laugh because no absolute monarch of the past ever had the power our current governments have. <laughs> I mean, it, it they, just they makes... could be overthrown so easily, so quickly. Not, not even overthrown. There are things they couldn't do. Uh, Henry VIII could uh, knock off his wives, but he couldn't change the nature of marriage the way our masters have. Oh, yeah. He couldn't suddenly introduce polygamy or make gay marriage. And he certainly couldn't declare that one set of human beings were no longer human, i.e., the unborn. Perfect. Or. Right. Yeah. Today, the elderly. Yeah. You know, you lose your humanity as soon as you're old. Oh, it's it's a slippery slope. Just like unborn, well, elderly. What's next? It's what's next, indeed. And who has the right? Who has usurped and arrogated themselves to themselves the right to make those determinations? Well, no quote unquote absolute monarch ever had that kind of power. That we give our owners today. Yeah, we give, and that's the I think the the main critique of democracy from my point of view is that the majority you can easily get the majority of immoral people to to give the 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 power to the current government to to produce immoral laws and etc. Sure, sure. I mean, you know, it it it's a um, it's a weird paradox. Uh, but of course, it's there are a lot of a lot of writers who have seen it. You know, in pretend, in thinking ourselves free, we become slaves. Uh, because real freedom is the freedom to do not to do anything you want. Exactly. And if you can do exactly. anything you want, you'll become a slave. Yeah, yeah, it exactly. Like uh, as I mentioned before, Bishop Schneider writes in his book Christus Vincit, like the the real freedom that God gave us, the free will is the free will to decide to, to choose him everything else it's not free will it's it's slavery it's that's that's correct it's it's bondage to to satan and to to everything earthly that's correct if you if you will not give yourself freely to god then you will give yourself as a slave to the devil yeah. those those are your choices and we have those we have that choice as human beings as individuals we have that choice as nations yeah uh But at any rate, so the as I say, as, as the the king in a traditional setup would be in a sense a bit like the president of the United States, only not quite as powerful, because um, let's just say that the president's able to get away with a lot precisely because we elect him. But he could have his own army. Well, he did, he is limited. One of, the, one of the reasons why medieval kings, if they wanted to go to war, had to call the estates to do so is that the way, the way life ran in those days, number one, there was a lot less government than we have now, but number two, the king financed the regular doings of his government through his own lands, through his own property. If he wanted to do anything beyond that, he really had to raise taxes, but to do that, He had to get the permission of the estates. It varied from place to place, but that's generally how it ran. So that's why the idea of Parliament having the right to declare war arose. Because at the end of the day, the people Parliament represents are the ones who have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that right. becomes a matter of simple justice. Um, I mean, mutatis mutandis in our system... Uh, I, uh, I don't own any property. So I always vote no on raising land taxes. Why? Because I'm not going to be paying them. <laughs> well. well, I'm not. So even if I think that it's, it's a cause that I like, like expanding libraries or whatever, I'm, not, I'm going to vote no because I'm not in a position to say yes. If I vote to spend money raised from taxes that I don't pay, That's theft. Well, taxation is theft anyway. So. Well, there's that. But <laughs> uh, I, 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 this is something I've always felt very strongly about. Since I'm not a property owner, 
I don't believe I should have the right to raise taxes on those who pay them when I don't. Yeah, well, that's fair. It's, I would think. And it's a very Catholic stance, so it's kind of expected. Think. Kind of expected. No, I I, uh, I told my brother, uh, who does own property, believe me, he's the, the, he's the one with the money. Uh, <laughs> you know, I told him about this, this particular uh, uh, method of mine. And he said, "Well, that's good." He says, "If if if ever there's a uh, if ever there's a, um, uh, a an important vote coming up on uh, on raising our taxes, I'll deed you about a square foot of property so you can feel like voting on it." <laughs> <laughs> but, but but by giving him by giving you his land, you'd have to pay tax. So well, that's the thing. Even on a square foot, so no thanks. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, you know, I, I, I have to say that of the seven deadly sins, the one that was left out of my nature was envy. I got but, a double dose of sloth to make up for it. <laughs> but envy, everything in life costs. And I've always had the, I can't call it a gift, but the facility of seeing what people have to go through to maintain what they have. Oh, yeah. So I don't envy it. Do know. tell, do tell. Well, you, you wouldn't know running a hotel, but it's a lot of work. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I would I, how do I put this? It's it's rather like in my neighborhood, but not here. But back home, I uh, I live in a, a very middle class neighborhood. Nothing to write home about. But nearby, there's a very wealthy section with beautiful houses and gardens, gorgeous. And whenever I'm feeling a little down, I hop in the car and I drive through them, and I feel great. I feel wonderful looking at these places. And I get to enjoy them without paying a dime for them. <laughs> Now, the people who own them, do I envy them? No. The taxes they have to pay, the problems they've got with employing gardeners and things like that, uh, the, the problems with landscaping. <laughs> no, thank you. I'm happy to enjoy them for free. I'm glad they do them. I'm glad they put them in there. You bet. Yeah. But to have one of my own... That's that's part of the aesthetics. I was talking about in Slovenia and a few videos back when I was talking about aesthetics and how, uh, from my point of view, one is obliged when owning a house or a property to keep it tidy and, and to, yeah. to fit in the community. And, it's, and that's exactly what you're talking about. So you enjoy it, yeah. not owning it or anything, but you enjoy it. And I think that's that's... That's excellent. That's perfect combination of ethics and you as an outsider enjoying the the uh, aesthetics. Pardon. Yeah. So, so you, yeah. And it's 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 wonderful. So I really I really appreciate uh, appreciate that they do it. And if I lived in the same town, um, I'd you know I don't know I'd uh, join the garden club. But <laughs> I uh, but at any rate. So you you've got those two things: the altar and the throne. Okay, yeah. There's a third thing, which today modern Catholic social theorists like to call subsidiarity. Uh, in the uh, in the old days, they had names like local liberties. Uh, the Carlists called them the fueros, that is the local laws. Um, the thing is that a monarch of the traditional persuasion was able to rule each section of his realm in accordance with its own laws. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, that bound him. Remember what I said about there not being absolute? Yeah. Uh, and it also meant that you might have to rule one section one way and another another. So it's like Maritain talking about sovereign. Yeah. There's really not any sovereign. Not in the modern sense. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the uh, and Austria-Hungary was, was a typical example. I mean, the emperor was emperor of Austria, all right. But uh, in your particular case, he was Duke of Corinthia. Yeah. And that was really your connection to him. But he was, uh, he was Kaiser as well, so he was... Uh... Yeah, well, he had both roles. Yeah. Kaiser for the outside world. But he had a connection with you that was partly national, but also local. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, Corinthia, like the other uh, Austrian lands, had its own uh, its own estates its own landtag and did its own uh, its own thing um and this similarly i don't know if you ever heard of eric von kudner the dean 
but he's fairly well known in the states actually austrian political writer and historian uh died about 20 years ago but he made an interesting point about patriotism in general specifically in austria hungary and the distinguish between a uh, uh a nationalist and a patriot and he said a um a bohemian patriot would love the Czechs and the Sudeten Deutsch because they happen to be in Bohemia. Okay. Whereas a Sudeten Deutsch or Czech nationalist would want all Bohemians to be Sudeten Deutsch or Czech. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's it's the same. I mean, you're kind of. I think you're kind of suggesting to nationalisms. Yeah. And that was a huge blow to monarchies in Europe. Oh, it was. Especially. It was. At, one might think it was stated like it was the, the French from French Revolution on it was the perpetual strife to destroy monarchies and what better tool to use than nationalism I mean in, in Austrian Empire I think there were about 24 nations oh, am I correct indeed. something like that and it worked I mean as it worked. from our for, from our point of view as outsiders now in this time, um, because th there could be some objections like, well, not everyone lived well. You had to do this. You had to like you had to learn German. But I say, listen, you fellas, mean, unlike today, unlike yeah, 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 yeah. Where, well, where, every, where everyone lives wonderfully. Yeah, yeah, and and everyone speaks their own language apart from speaking English when you want to speak internationally and stuff like that. But it was the same like that. We are a two million people nation, which was probably even lower at that time, head count. But yeah. we kept our culture and our language in this huge monarchy. But when the, the you know what, there's a feast in Slovenia today. Oh, what's that? Yeah, we're celebrating the the direct translation would be um, the day of resistance towards the occupator. It's a communist uh, feast. Oh yes, of course, that's right. And yeah, yeah, they don't even know which date to set because they were so drunk. And uh, especially when what they did was they they transformed the anti-imperialistic front into um oh, oh like I, I forgot now so like a communist front and they, they decided they're not against uh imperialistic forces anymore like united states and england but because the the pact ribbentrop molotov was destroyed they were now against germany and so yeah well you, you see the thing is the problem with these revolutions is that, uh, and that's even true of the American Revolution, is that they're filled with contradictions. Yeah, I, that's... You know, you always have a new authority that comes along and says, all right, we're throwing out the old guys. We're in charge now. Swear allegiance. Like, it's that's a progressive thing to be... A, I mean, the, the church is also very, very... Especially if we read Chesterton, uh, we can see how contradictory that the catholic church is but not in in that way no well i mean the the, the contradictions of the church uh well there's there's an old saying that the the 60s were the french revolution of the church oh yeah uh, there's oh. a certain amount of truth to it i lived through it in the states it was different of course in the then yugoslavia but in the states it was horrible i i know it, it formed my boyhood. Yeah, I, I usually uh, say to my friends that we had we were lucky to be behind the Iron Curtain because it worked as a as a can, kind of. It's as a, a in some conservation ways, can. In some ways, it did. I mean, uh, there's one thing is that you were spared a lot of the, um, for want of a better word, a lot of the self hatred that Western Europeans acquired. Oh, uh, it was uh, guilt. I think yeah. implemented on them, especially Germans, and yeah, yeah, and and the problem with that kind of guilt. See, firstly, we're talking about a culture where we murder infants constantly. Okay, now I don't think we're the best judges of morality, and the best judges of the past. Maybe when we stop killing babies, 
maybe then, you know, when we stop, uh, oh, I don't know, desecrating. Ma- but you, you think, sorry to interrupt, you think people will, will come to terms by realizing that killing unborn is is actually a crime? It's a murder? I, I think to- we're that far that majority of people don't really perceive abortion as de facto murder no they they don't and all i can say is they might when they're eating dog food because enough children weren't born to raise their pensions well i hope that happens as soon as possible but the don't. pressure i'm is gonna on be us. the one eating i'm gonna be yeah. the one eating dog food don't you don't you be wishing that on me thank you very much no we, we'll take care of you sir no problem we'll, we'll take I, care I tell you, this is apropos of nothing, but years ago, I was at a party in Hollywood, and they were running low on food and booze. So uh, this lady I know and myself, we went up to the nearby market to get more food and booze for the party. We saw this beautifully dressed old woman. I mean, she looked like a million dollars. You'd want her for your grandmother. Age appropriate, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I can imagine. But but gorgeous. Pearls and stuff. Exactly, like that. but not overdone. But she did have pearls, and she she just she looked wonderful, and she was pushing a shopping cart, and it was filled with bottles of scotch, and cans of dog food, and nothing else. Okay. Scotch whiskey and dog food. That was it. For her. Who knows? But that was all there was in the shopping cart. So, my friend turns to me and she says. What do you think that means? And I said, uh, it's easier to keep down when you marinate it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's. I, but no, I, I mentioned this though because um, we will pay a price for this. Uh, yeah. This this is not going to. I mean, we may not catch on. We may be too stupid to realize what we're doing, but we will pay. But at any rate, uh, the uh, the two other points I want to touch on are the point and a half. Yeah, <laughs> subsidiarity then is the, is the, the third point of Catholic uh, traditional Catholic monarchy. The fourth is what modern Catholic social theorists would call solidarity. What uh, Marx and people like that called class collaboration, which they hated. Um, but what other people would have called uh, solidarism, corporatism, distributism, guild socialism, there are all sorts of names for it. But basically it meant the different elements of society, the different social classes, working together as a family mm-hmm. rather than as, mm-hmm. a, than as a collection of feuding interests. You think that's uh, inherited especially in monarchy? or it's? No, I do. I do because the remember that the king, uh, first and foremost, at least, regards himself as father of his nation. Yeah. Well, that makes us all brothers under under the single father, doesn't it? Well, of course, and especially if it's a Catholic monarchy, you cannot you cannot go past that that we're at least Precisely. brothers and sisters, like. Precisely, uh, and that's why the religious nature of the state comes back into play because mm-hmm. the thing about about this sort of system, and again, we'll we'll use the word corporatism. It's a bad word, I know, in a lot of places. Okay. But let's hold on to it. What did it mean? Well, it meant that every section of production, say the shoemakers, all right. Well, you you've got the factories that make shoes, and that means the owners, i.e., capital, the people who work in the factories. You've got the independent shoemakers who um, also pretty much set the fashions. You've got the sales people, uh, you know, the retail end of things. Mm-hmm. Well, those are the, the different the merchants and yeah. the merchants. Yeah. Well, those are all the different elements of the shoe trade. Well, in a in the regular system that we know, the capitalist system that we're aware of, they're feuding with each other all the time. Uh, the re- retail want to. Uh, they pay as little as they can and sell it as high as they can. Oh, I, oh, I understand where you're going. Yeah, and labor, you know, it, yeah, labor want every dime they can yank out of capital. Capital want to uh, save every penny they can keep from the worker. Um, they're a perpetual war with each other. Yeah. So, the idea then is that these guys should collaborate. 
the uh, the uh, workers should get a just wage that allows them to live, but doesn't drive capital, doesn't make uh, make the whole thing unprofitable for capital. Is is this uh, E. Michael Jones or? No, it's not. It's it's Leo Thirteenth. It's Pius the Eleventh. Okay. But, I'm just teasing a bit, yeah. Ah, but the, the, the problem with it is that unlike capitalism, which functions very well purely on its own, I mean, we all have, we're all greedy. We all want as much as we can get. Um, these, these uh, and socialism is really the same way. It's just eliminating everybody except the working class. I think socialism, if, if you uh, connect capitalism to greed, I think socialism ought to be connected to sloth to laziness yeah and envy and envy I mean, and envy of course yeah and there's the old joke that under capitalism man oppresses his fellow man and under communism it's the reverse <laughs> but the the uh yeah the thing is that uh the problem with the sort of system that uh leo and pius were talking about is that it cannot operate purely for economic reasons there has to be a higher motive of a course. higher uh, a higher philosophy behind it, it it has to be transcendental or i don't know it, it, well, exactly it has to transcend the everyday need so the uh, nazis had a version of corporatism that saw the, the race as the whole thing mm -hmm. uh, mussolini's fascists had a, a similar thing which actually was pretty successful it, it appears anyway to have kept them out of the depression Uh, which all the rest of the world suffered from. But it made the state the reason for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, in the sort of system that Pius and Leo were talking about, it would be the faith that would operate that, that role. So that's, that's your fourth leg. The last part, I call it a half a point, because it's the least defined of the bunch. And that is the notion that all Catholic, all Christian states are actually part of a greater whole. Mm -hmm. uh, Christendom, uh, l'Occident, as the French would say, Abendland, as our German friends would call it. Uh, the greater Europe, if you want. Um, it, it's Otto von Habsburg made the, uh, made the comment uh, years and years ago. And remember, this was when the Soviet Union was still very much a going concern. Do you know that he, he said, was uh, that who was a big friend of Slovenia? Oh, I do know. Oh. I, I know very well. I knew him. You see. Oh. Uh, you have he, any photos? Uh, uh, no, I don't have any photos. I only met him twice. Perfect. We uh, okay. we corresponded from the time that I was in high school. Wow, great. And that's that's an interesting thing there. Uh, and by the way, it's not because I was such a wonderful person. I found out that he did this with a lot of people. Oh, yeah. yeah. He I, kept I, up a huge correspondence. Okay, sorry to interrupt, but I just... No, no, no not at all. I, I was just going to say, though, that uh, I, I had some questions. I was a, a senior in high school, maybe a junior, and I wrote him uh, a long letter with a lot of questions. And he wrote back a long letter with a lot of answers. Perfect. Yeah, that's and they were good answers. They were, you know, thought uh, I've still I've still got them all. Yeah, I, so I, I them. you got answers to your questions. That that's why you mean by good answers. Yeah, and they were th thought out, intelligent. Oh yeah. Uh, so I was in touch with him until he died, and the uh, I met him twice. I met him first when his son, the Archduke Karl, uh, ran for. Uh, the European Parliament in 1999 on an independent ticket, which, alas, did not succeed. Hmm. Um, and then I met him the second time at the beatification of his father in Rome. And uh, that was, it was an amazing experience both times. But I, I would send him, I guess, the last 15 or so years of his life, on his birthday in November and at Christmas, I would send him seize candies, which are made in Southern California and nowhere else in the world. Well, I got to know over here in these past two years, I got to know his last secretary, a lady named Ava Demily. And she knew who I was because she said, oh, your name is known to me. I, all your correspondence went through my head. So I said, well, all right. And I asked her, did you ever see any of the seized I sent? And she said, I heard about them. I never <laughs> saw them. <laughs> so and I thought, well. He liked them. 
Yeah, apparently so. But I, I mention this because he was very much, he had a very, very great idea of Europe, of a, of a Christian Europe. Um, in the beginning, like the founders of the EU, he mm. was very much a supporter of the EU. Because people like Adenauer and de Gasperi and Schumann saw in some sense the EU as a possibility of reviving the work of Charlemagne. Oh, but, you know, they were Christians. I don't know about being Catholics, but they were. No, they were Catholic. Oh, okay. All all three of them. In fact, uh, all three of them at different times were considered for uh, uh, being put up for sainthood. Ah. Um. And that, because they're all three of them very devout Catholics. So that was the vision of the EU that uh, was dancing around in their heads. It was the vision that Otto von Habsburg had. Mm. Uh, it's not what happened. I, I hate to break the news. Well, but... we, we can see it, so yeah. No, no, I, I, I hate to intrude. <laughs> Well, you know, we're commenting on United States affairs and feel free to comment on European affairs. So, <laughs> Well, I, I mean, honestly, um, if, if, I were, if I were asked, I would say a couple of things. One is that it's very obvious that what Central Europeans mean by European values is very different from what Brussels means. And it's very different from what the Western governments mean. Uh, for your country, as for Hungary and Czechia and Slovakia and Poland and Romania and so forth, and even, you know, still for a lot of people in Spain and France and Germany and Italy and so on, not, not the people running the show necessarily. European values means the faith, it means family, it means civilization, it means culture. Tradition, means, yeah. Yeah, tradition, law, all that stuff. Whereas for... The rulers, anyway, in the West, it means abortion, contraception, gender confusion. Yeah. That's what it means. Everyone's so, rights. And... <laughs> everyone's rights to nothing. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and complete, uh, complete, well, I mean, the ability to shut things down totally if you need to or want to or feel like it. Um, I, I hope for the sake of our rulers around the world that this will have turned out to have been worth it. I really do. Uh, I don't know that it was. I don't know that it wasn't. But I hope for their sakes it was. I think we'll never know. But probably not. Probably they not. should probably step from the break as soon as possible. Because especially in Slovenia, I mean, I, I, can, t- I can talk about Slovenia. People are getting jumpy. And it's... Well, yeah. I, and... and in in Austria, it's they're not they're not getting so jumpy here, but of course part of it is that we're already starting to open up. And you know, when you're when you see the prospect of things getting better, you can put up with a lot. Well, but you know, the media in Slovenia it's it's uh, very much in hands of former regime, and now for two months now we have a kind of right government from a uh, Mr. Janša is the prime minister the, the one from the um, independence era war from 1990 uh, and most the majority of Slovenians are against him oh. against him because the media tells them so I mean I, I'm not a huge fan but he's his kind of traditional Christian something ish politician Ish. yeah and uh, i kind of support him in that way and but you know we have two months of yansha and everyone's fed up with him because the media tells that everything that's wrong it's because of him and that's Which... when i say people are, are being jumpy it's what i mean there they, like today when on the feast of uh resistance against the occupator in 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 capital in Ljubljana. A, about 200, 300 people gathered to protest against Yansha. It, like, it kind of fits to the narrative of the feast, you know? Yeah, and that, well, I mean, it's, 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 a, big, uh, it's a big problem in, in a lot of places. It's certainly in, uh, in the United States, we're having more and more demonstrations and so forth against the lockdown. And it's, it's very hard to say. 
because the the let's say the narratives of this disease are so conflicting. You really yeah. don't know who to believe, and the numbers are flying around. Everybody's got statistics. Well, okay. Uh, if you say eighty percent of the population are uh, asymptomatic, of the population that have it, they don't mm. have symptoms. Well, yeah. What does it's, it all it's, mean? It's confusing, and as 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 we both said, I think we will never know. No, probably what, not. What, what was the real deal? But uh, the, let's go uh, back to those uh, point five points. Oh, yeah. uh, I, I wanted to give a comment on that. Sure. When you said, as as a Christian nations, we would be striving, or we'd have to strive for a Christian brotherhood, kind of. I think the the, the Catholic monarchs, in that perspective, failed every single time. Oh, you bet. Uh, because unfortunately, as with everything else in life, they suffered from a terrible setback. They were human beings. Yeah. But having said that, when it were, when it didn't work, it was bad. When it did work, it worked very well. Hmm. And it worked better than anything we're capable of doing. Exactly. And that's, you see, there's, there's a, a key thing here. I mean, the usual narrative, in my country anyway, goes, oh, Henry VIII was evil, and he was a king. George Washington was wonderful, and he was a president. But see, that's as stupid as comparing St. Louis to Hitler. Yeah. yeah. It's a stupid thing to do. I mean, I and the, the worst of it is, I could pull out over the range of history, I could pull out any number of royal saints. Of course. You can't, sh you can't show me a single president who's been a saint. Not one. <laughs> Not one? I don't, I don't know all the saints, but... No. Because there haven't been... They just haven't been presidents for very long. Well, you, could, you couldn't be. <laughs> if, if... Even if they... No! Would be saints, I think they would never be presidents. No. You, you can become a president. Be any kind of a politician. Yeah, you, yeah, exactly. You've got, to crawl, you've got to crawl up to the top of the muck. Yeah, yeah. And you see... Where where we where the whole the whole conversation is skewed is we always start from the presumption that what we're doing now is best. I was um, I was actually reading a life of one of your Slovenian figures, uh, the great monarchist Ivan Shustovic. Mm -hmm. Shustovic, yeah. What you said. And <laughs> yeah. He um, I'm not going to be able to pretend to, to pronounce his name as well. But what was interesting in the biography I was reading, which was from the official Slovenian uh, collection of biographies, hmm? was that it, uh, it was sort of sympathetic, but it said he didn't realize he was fighting against historical necessity. Meaning? Indeed. Indeed. Meaning just what? The whole concept is ridiculous. Historical necessity. The implication is that what we have now is perfect, and so all of history was bending toward us in all of our perfection. Yeah. Well, I'd be more inclined to believe that if we were perfect, but instead I see what we are. Exactly. That's what I wanted to point out at this, right at this moment. If we could step like five steps back and look at our society as it is, I think we'd be terrified. Well, like a yeah, bunch, I... bunch of masturbators, uh, unborn children, killers, and whatnot. Is, 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 that, is that a perfection? No, because... it's horrific. It's, it's disgusting. And the sad thing is for me, I mean, I'm old enough to remember something somewhat different. Mind you, uh, I look back at my youth and my childhood. And it was better in the way that the secondary stage of a disease is better than the tertiary stage. <laughs> okay. You know, it's a lot better when you're just getting these headaches all the time than when chunks are falling out of you. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> well, yeah, and you look back, boy, that was great. Well, it really wasn't great objectively. You were still had, you still had the disease, but it sure felt better. And so when I look to uh, – when I look to uh, – Uh, my own past and the, the America that I was born into and raised in, it looks wonderful in comparison to what we have now. Mm. But it was going in the way we're going now. 
Oh, uh, uh, may I just a, a short commentary here? Sure. I, I I just decided I don't know I'm bored and <laughs> I, I mean when I have when I have some free time I hope my wife doesn't listen to this because <laughs> I'm not bored okay um, but when I have free time I say okay what now I don't want I don't try to play any computer games and stuff like that uh, so I decided to start watching Mad Men. Oh yeah. And. I watched five episodes, and I think it's happening around the time you're mentioning now. It is, yeah. And apart from them constantly smoking, yes. what I saw, and I discussed this with my wife, is that the um, that very fine immorality they they lived. Oh. I mean, they they all lived very neatly dressed and very polite to each other but just above the surface of that it was it was like having mistresses homosexuality drugs uh i mean it was it was a disaster well it was it was the last stage on the way to where we are yeah i mean we yeah. have all all the bad stuff and none of the good we have none of the style none of the okay. manners yeah, the, the uh, I'll tell you something funny about that program. Although it's set in New York in my childhood, it of course was filmed in Los Angeles of five years ago. <laughs> uh, and the funny thing is, my brother and I, my older brother, we're seven years apart, and we're very different people in terms of temperament and personality and so forth. But we have very similar tastes. Mm. If I like a bar or a restaurant, he'll like it. And so you both you both have good taste. We hope. Fine taste, yeah. But here's the fun part. Every single one of our favorite bars and restaurants were used as sets by Mad Men. Okay. Every single <laughs> one. So my mother, alas, died in 2015. So we took her back home to bury her. And at the, uh, after the funeral... My cousins and my aunt, my brother and me, and our friends, we went out to a place in New York, the old town, for the, uh, as we called it, the mother of all wakes. And <laughs> we had a this fact to my cousins that, you know, all of, all of our favorite places have been used by madmen, blah, blah, blah. And they just started laughing. And I said, what's so funny? <laughs> and Jamie looks at me, this the, the young one, he says, uh, you don't get it, do you? He says, no, I don't. What's so funny? You and Andre are unconsciously trying to relive the New York of our childhoods. Well, we can't do it, and we live here. There's no <laughs> yeah. way you're going to be able to do it in L.A. It's not possible. <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, but, you know, talking about morality, it's, it's the, the first thing that came to mind to me because the, the, it, everyone is so polite on the outside. And now nobody's even polite on the outside. Well, see, that's the trick. The outside has become like the inside. Uh, you know, hypocrisy is impossible if you have no standards. Okay. If you don't have any standards, you can't be a hypocrite. Yeah, I'm lying in the mud. So what? Well, oh, oh, yeah, I know what. Oh, yeah. So that, I'm wearing two short shorts. Judge me. Yeah, exactly. Okay, you're a slob. Go away. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the thing is that uh, there's an old saying that hypocrisy is the compliment that virtue pays, uh, sorry, that vice pays to virtue. Hmm. But that's only possible where there are standards. Of course. And I wanted to, okay, sorry. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, you also bear in mind that after all, Mad Men was a TV show. And while the sort of thing they were talking about did actually go on, it wasn't everybody by a long shot. Yeah. But it certainly was present. And, you know, you had magazines like Playboy uh, back in the 50s. Now, to be fair, the 50s version of Playboy was nothing like the 60s or 70s version or the current. Um, you, um, you didn't have the full frontal nudity and things like that. That mm. they have today, uh, but it was going in that direction. Well, it was a tease, probably, to start with. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, my dad 
who was a tail gunner in World War II against the Japanese. You know, he's in the back of the bomb of the bombers. And... So a badass. Well, you wouldn't have known it to know him because he was very much a gentleman, very polite. But yeah, he you couldn't well, shift to, him to, to sit there so exposed and oh yeah to live through that. Yep, he had uh, he had twelve successful missions. Wow. When the average uh, the average uh, uh, lifespan in combat for a tail gunner was something like seconds. Yeah, I mean uh, you're, you're there. <laughs> Yeah, with this glass ball. Yeah. Going, Down there's the Pacific. There's the zero fire at you with his yeah. machine gun. Well, what do you do? But that that was my dad. And he um very, very funny, funny, funny man. Great sense of humor. Uh but boy, well spoken, very much a gentleman. You couldn't shake him. You couldn't intimidate him. Hmm. And many of the time I've seen him stand up to people who thought they could, and it wasn't smart. <laughs> At any rate, he, um, uh, I asked him once, I said, you know, Dad, what do you think was the worst thing that ever happened to our country in your lifetime? Well, I thought for sure he was going to say the 60s or something like that. No. He said World War II. Yeah. I said, uh, he said World War II. It was the worst thing that ever happened to the okay. United States. Huh? I said, but dad, we won World War II. And he looked at me and he said, son, you in a war the way you win an earthquake. He said, the damage that that war did to our country's society has never been repaired. Hmm. Standards fell down the, uh, down the tubes. And he said, you had a whole generation that spent five years or more without their fathers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are a pair of comedians still, they're still with us, thankfully, I like them although they're real left wing, but they're very funny, called the Smothers Brothers. And, okay. I'm sorry? No, no, I'm just, yeah. Yeah, and we used to watch their show religiously back in the 60s because, again, they were lefty. We didn't like their politics, but they were very, very funny guys. <laughs> and he said, uh, you know how the Smothers Brothers were always joking about their mother and their, mother, and their relationship with their mother? And so I said, yeah. You notice how they never spoke about their father? Well, yeah. And he said, that's because Colonel Smothers died on the Bataan Death March. Hmm. So he said, what you saw in the 60s, to a great degree, came out of this horror that was World War II in America. Yeah, well, it was probably everywhere in the world, so. Well, and it was worse in Europe. I mean, what you guys went through was hell. But no, I'm in America, talking especially about fatherless generations oh, and that was sure. just start of it because i sure. think in 70s and in 80s it started uh, with a abandonment of fathers so like the absence well, yeah, of fathers I, I, not just not having a father i mean having a father figure knowing that maybe he died as a war hero or something like that could be kind of supportive and you can still say, well, my dad was a, I don't know, war hero. He died fighting the war. But in 70s and 80s, you, you could only say, well, my mother would, was, I mean, my father was chased out by by my mother from our house. And that. Yeah. And, and how are you supposed to uh, build a marriage and a family out of that? Yeah. Uh, you've got the added problem, of course, that. We, we often equate the American uh, baby boom generation, of which I have the uh, honor, privilege, yeah. <laughs> honor, whatever, to be a very junior member because uh, the boom runs from 1944 to 1964. Mm-hmm. And I was born in 1960. So I get all the opprobrium of being a boomer and none of the, <laughs> none of the privileges. You, you, but, you caught the last train. so Yeah, exactly. I just got on it. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And now you don't but, even own the land. No, I got nothing. <laughs> but the uh, the uh, but that's our our boomers who were, as I say, they had they they were fatherless. I wasn't, of course, but the older ones were, mm. uh, and the children of privilege at the same time, because of course the immediate post-war years for the United States were amazing. Whatever damage the war did to the United Material States, material-wise. Huge, yeah. absolutely gigantic. Pulled us out of the depression and created the post-war boom. In Europe, however, the generation of '68 
who are our, our peers chronologically, uh, they grew up uh, again with a lot of uh, a lot of deprivation. They very often were taught to or came to despise their parents as collaborators. Uh, it, 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 and then in 68, of course, they went crazy. And the older generation, instead of spanking them and sending them to bed, uh, basically surrendered. Well, and punk rock was born. Well, there's that. <laughs> uh, I mean, you look at, for instance, and these are small things taken as individual phenomena, but it's, it's worth remembering. In Germany, the universities got rid of all the academic regalia. Uh, the police got rid of their shakos. You know, it was all, oh, well, it's very upsetting. Yeah. Oh, gee, willikers. Oh. <laughs> and now, now those people are running us in church and state. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we can sense they're, it. Yeah. Because, they're, oh, gee, willikers, I'm in charge and you're not. What? Okay, you, well. You want to kneel at the mass? It, it will hurt your knees. We have to just, like, clap and, I don't know. Happy clapping. Well, I want. I want to go started. there. I want to go there. I think we we still have few minutes. All right. Ten, fifteen, twenty, and I want to go there. And I wanted to go there when we started to talk about Mad Men and about a facade, but uh, not well. but not being a facade. But what you said, like you need a form to fill it with something. Yeah, and that the the form. The, the problem, in a sense, to me anyway, the problem with the world of Mad Men, the world of my childhood, is the same problem with the surviving monarchies in Europe. Mm. They have the beautiful form. I mean, today in the Netherlands is King's Day. And if it weren't for the lockdown, there'd be all sorts of beautiful ceremonies and all that, which are wonderful and should be maintained, I believe. But the problem is they've been emptied of substance. Yeah, yeah. You know, um... This is true of a lot of things. I mean, it's true of academic ritual, which I, I love academic ritual. Mm. You know, it's it's beautiful, except that they're not really studying anything but garbage. You know, Marxism and gender studies. Well, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, why, why have a ceremonial to celebrate somebody spending four years of his life reading garbage? But, you know, I think in this case... Here it's our duty to to to, to bring back the substance, because oh, yeah. I think the traditionalists, especially the 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 uh, knights as yourself, as as I may say, so the the the, the people as as yourself, are you have this very good insight in situation as it is, and you and maybe my generation as well, the traditionalists can see what the substance is and that it is needed. Yeah. Not that not that it just exists, but that it is needed. It is needed. And we should look, I think, we should look at everything from the old mass to uh, dancing around the maypole, huh. uh, which is so, hardly the same thing. But the customs of a place, the customs of a people, have an importance in their own way. They need to be married to something bigger, hmm. just just like etiquette needs to be. But it, these things should be seen, though, not as the last remnants of a glorious past, yeah. but, but as the building blocks of a future. Exactly. So when they try to set us up with formalism and stuff like that, our argument is that it's not. It's not just formalism. It's not that no. we we LARP, if you know the term, LARPing. Oh, I, I know the term. I've so, been accused so of it. That, yeah, exactly. Myself as well. So we're not LARPers. But as I said before, we understand the importance of essence. No. Ah, and that, I mean, let's put this another way. I have had people say to me, well, you know, uh, as you say, it's empty of it's empty of substance. What good is the form? Well, take away the form under this current circumstance. What do you have left? And the answer is nothing. Exactly. At this moment, especially. At this moment, especially. You know, there was a phrase in the 60s that always, uh, in America, that always cracked me up because 
the potential for, for just being horrific was there. It was, let it all hang out. Mm. <laughs> and you know, the problem is that as the American population has gotten fatter, more obese, letting it all hang out probably isn't a good idea. <laughs> yeah, well. Because it... you'd be surprised the, the, the horrors that a three-piece suit can, can, can hide. <laughs> and I, I I remember this with the uh, the nuns. I was taught uh, in 1968. I was taught by the Immaculate Heart nuns in uh, Blessed Sacrament Church, Hollywood, California. And they dropped their habits. It was a big, big event. It's oh. well known. Look up Immaculate Heart nuns, Carl Rogers. You'll find all kinds of stuff about it on the internet. Well, I lived through that. That was my introduction, in a sense, to the revolution. Well, my apologies. Well, you're not a nun, so you're, there's nothing you can do about it. But, <laughs> but the funny thing about that was that their habits were beautiful. Now, yeah. mind you, all you saw was the face. Of course, th that's the traditional nun habit. Oh, yes. And they were beautiful. Then they took them off. And I remember my father saying, you know, that habit covered a multitude of sins. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> it could be, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, that's uh, for us men, you know, the three-piece suit, uh, which I'm a huge promoter of um, oh. on the on the vest. You keep the lowest button unbuttoned <laughs> Yep, well, for a reason. <laughs> yes, you can thank Edward VII for that. He was <laughs> Prince of Wales because he, uh, he had a gun, all right. And, and uh, you know, it... it It's an amazing thing, really. Uh, there's a, 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 a how, do you, how do you say, a cloth, a kind of cloth called seersucker. Mm. And it's a light summer weight material. And so you generally see it with blue or brown and white stripes. Okay. And we call it seersucker. Well, it's a, it was used for summer suits. I mean, today, of course, when it gets hot, people just dress like bums. But... <laughs> yeah. In the back in the day, they wore, they wore lightweight suits, very lightweight. And seersucker was a very comfortable. I've got several seersucker suits here. Uh, very very comfortable material, and it was very popular for that reason. Well, my great uncle, my dad's uncle by marriage, he was an inventor, and he invented a way of making seersucker very cheap. Okay. So the seersucker companies paid him not to market his process. <laughs> well, so, that's one way to earn the money. <laughs> that was well, it was a lot easier than actually going through the, the pain of trying to find uh, find a producer and so on. So he lived the rest of his life. He bought a house and all that kind of thing off this money that came in regularly for not marketing it. So he called his home the house that seersucker built. <laughs> and he called the the companies the seer suckers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, But, uh, yeah. Well, I was just going to say uh, there were a lot of things, and we're coming into summer right now. You know, straw hats and seer sucker suits, and uh, light gowns to the ladies. These are small things, and they're not important in and of themselves, but they're part of a bigger whole. Yeah, and I think. When you mentioned hats, for me, and I just, I just kind of take it as something really important. Not leaving the house with my hat uncovered. No. Yeah. And and I try to encourage my 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 male friends to do the same. Like I I try to tell them it's, but it's it's not a it's not a condition anymore. If I say it's a manly thing because they don't understand manly no it's no the, the term is just it it vanished and i i really can't explain to them what it means that something is a manly thing like it's a manly thing to get if if you have a a partner or whatever a girlfriend to get married it's a manly no. thing to to be a father to raise your children to not abandon them it's a manly thing to wear uh so th three three piece suit and to wear a hat to, to to have your head covered when you leave the house no And That's, they don't understand. Well, they don't understand yet. They may. 
one thing, of course, I always tell my friends that uh, I wear a hat all the time and notice I've got a full head of hair. Uh, yeah. I mean, because one arg argument against that could be, well, you're going to be bald. Where? Well, no. I'm turning 60 this year. I don't think it's happening. <laughs> yeah, well, you have a magnificent haircut. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I was very fortunate. One of the people here I'm in lockdown with was a professional barber once upon a time. And he, I finally got my hair. I had this huge Beatles-esque mop. And boy, was I glad to get rid of it a few days ago. Uh, you developed that during the quarantine. Uh, yeah, during the lockdown. lockdown well, you know, yeah. It's been months since I'd had my last haircut. But the other thing, too, uh, that's interesting for, for what it's worth, in the summer, people wore straw hats instead of felt. And I uh, this is apropos of nothing, but it's kind of funny. Uh, there were two basic kinds of more popular. One was the Panama hat which looks like a regular fedora, only made of straw. Mm -hmm. And the other is the boater, also called a skimmer. This is just a flat... Uh, oh, yeah. I can imagine, yeah. Yeah. Just like round and... Yeah, exactly. I, I have one. That's my summer hat here. I have one in, uh, back in LA as well. But uh, for years, the reason why I switched to a boater, which is kind of antique, for years, I'd get a Panama every summer, and they'd be ruined by the end of the summer. Now, that, that's always the case. Back in the day when they had big summer resorts, one of the end of summer rituals was that all the guests who were still there would throw their hats onto a bonfire. Oh, that's that awesome. was the way of saying goodbye that's to awesome. summer, you know. Well, because the, the, the Panama is ruined by the oh, end yeah. of summer. It, 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 in Slovenia, it's very famous, especially among farmers, because they're one of the few that still wear a hat. And they, and they need it. So And they the, need it, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so at it's, the end of the summer at all these big resorts, lakes and, and seaside and so forth, they, they have a big bonfire and, and throw their Panamas in. Well, up until about nine years ago, I had to get a new Panama every year. And then I thought, you know what? I'm going to try a boater this year. Even though it's going to make me look like I'm living in 1920, I don't care. I did. I've got that same boater nine years later. Yeah, and it costs the same as a Panama. Only I don't have to keep uh, putting out eighty-five bucks, one hundred and twenty-five bucks on Each a new year. hat every summer. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I, I well, I may I may look like I'm living in nineteen twenty-three, but I'll tell you what, <laughs> I'm saving money. And <laughs> well, and you look also like going on a dog races, or how do you say that? Well, there's there's that uh, <laughs> there's that, but no, seriously. These are these are again these are small things, but they're symbolically important. And yeah. Yeah. I I would encourage your audience to remember a few things. One of them is that you have an advantage over those of us in the West. And the advantage you have is that you are under communism. Now, why is that an advantage? Well, mm -hmm. it's because you saw up close and personal for a long time what our elites are trying to guide us into. Mm -hmm. Now, it was stupid before, but at least there was the excuse that it had been imposed militarily. Well, there's no excuse like that for our elites. They're just crazy and mm -hmm. stupid mm -hmm. and evil. That, you know, was one of my longtime jokes. I tell people, when I was a boy back in 72, 73, and they brought in abortion in the States. I came face to face with the fact that my rulers were evil people. All right. I knew my history even as a boy, and I knew that a lot of people in history had lived under evil people, and they survived, they managed, so all right. I'll, I deal with that. Then, under President Carter, I came to realize, yeah, they're evil, but they're also insane. They're crazy in the sense of being totally removed from reality. Hmm. Well, I didn't like that. But a lot of people have managed to live under evil, crazy regimes. You know, they just, they manage. But under President Obama, I came to realize, yeah, they're evil, yeah, they're, they're crazy, but they're also stupid. They don't know a lot. And the problem with being... 
being ruled by and they're stupid in that they don't know I apologize it's, it's being a bit of interrupted the, the connection is being a bit of interrupted so just uh, go just go back to Obama being uh, stupid so under under Obama I realized that they were also stupid yeah now well I don't mean Obama himself was stupid I mean yeah the totality the yeah now having said that um, the problem that you face with such a, a group is that their stupidity means that they don't make very good decisions. Their insanity means that they put the visions of the way things should be in their head over reality. Now, I will give you a concrete example of this, one, both of which your country endured. The one, of course, the people that we always like throwing rocks at, and not without reason, the Nazis. Now, one of the things that... You, you remember who Stauffenberg was, Klaus von Stauffenberg? Yes. Well, what really convinced him that the Nazis had to go, that Hitler had to go, without any question, was that when the Germans invaded the Soviet Union, they were greeted by children with flowers as liberators. Thousands of Soviet troops defected, including General Vlasov, the uh, division commander. Now, Stauffenberg was the German army's liaison with Vlasov on the Eastern Front. And he saw how the, uh, the Nazi party machinery was brought in as the army pushed eastward and began creating a resistance where there had been none. <laughs> the, the, the ideology was literally stealing victory, or defeat, rather. It was stealing defeat oh, yeah. from the jaws of victory. Yeah. They would have won. They, they were creating the enemy where it wasn't. Exactly. He could see how they were being destroyed because these people, all they cared about was their racial thing. Yeah. It was more important to them than winning. They could achieve so much more if... Absolutely. Absolutely. And the, the, uh, the funny thing about it, when the, uh, when the Soviets were closing in on Budapest, they had sent uh, Eichmann, the Germans had sent Eichmann. Remember that Admiral Horthy had been overthrown and replaced by the Arrow Cross, mm -hmm. who, who were sort of puppets in a way. Of the, but I mean, even they weren't, they weren't Nazis. They were not great people, but they were not, not they weren't insane. And so the uh, Hungarian Arrow Cross foreign minister, as the Soviets are closing in, Eichmann is there supervising the rounding up of Jews. And he goes in to see Eichmann and he says, uh, you know, maybe some of these troops should be allowed, you know, maybe you should stop hunting Jews and send the troops to the, fight the Soviets. What do you say? And Eichmann says, no, no, this makes it all the more important that we get them all. The sugar, as we say in Yiddish. The man was crazy. <laughs> he was nuts. All right. Take a step forward. The communists. They were crazy in the same way. They put their ideology over reality. And in the end, why did communism fail? It didn't fail because they suddenly became nice people. It failed because they could no longer provide the bare minimum of sustenance to their subjects. Well, that that was why they failed. I would have a question: Did it did it fail? Did it fail? Well, it was outspent. Yeah. I mean, at the at the end of the day, uh, what really pushed it over the edge was Reagan outspending them uh, defense wise. Uh, I mean, they had a very inefficient economy. You know, the old, the old joke about uh, uh, the, uh, the hundreds of warehouses in Siberia filled with left shoes. <laughs> well, well, you know, in, in Slovenia, if you ask my parents, which are still rather young, what is banana when they were young, they wouldn't know. No. Yeah. And it's a banana. I mean, when you go to grocery store today, you mostly buy bananas. <laughs> Well, that's because uh, Yugoslavia 
And that's the funny thing. Yugoslavia was in a better position than the Soviet bloc was. Oh, yeah, we, we definitely were. But it, it was no rose garden here. No, it was not. But it maybe, was... sir, uh, that for the next time. Well, I, I, will, I would also mention, though, uh, one of the funny things about the way the Soviets did things was that keep people quiet and, and preserve them to preserve them at more or less the standard of living they had had at the time they were incorporated into the Soviet bloc. Perfect. <laughs> well, but this produced a weird, weird paradox because the East Germans was sort of kind of where they were in 1949, 1948. Mm-hmm. The Poles were a little bit further back behind. The, uh, the Belarusians and so on. So the closer you got to Moscow, the worse things got. Mm-hmm. Because in most of Russia, they were sort of kept at where they had been about 1917. Yeah, October Revolution. And that, it, 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 was, it was done on the idea, I suppose, that they didn't know any better anyway. But it, it, you had the weird paradox that the Soviet subject peoples lived better than the Russians for the most part. Yeah, well, that's what I when I said earlier that uh, for one on one side that we were lucky to be in this conserve, like in this cans, yeah, because we preserved some values. Like for instance, I remember my grandmother wearing a scarf, and it's it's a really Slav thing to for your granny to to wear a scarf on her oh, head. Yeah. So oh yeah. Um, but, you know, I wanted to talk more about traditional Latin mass, but it sure. will not be too long. So maybe if you allow me to talk another time with you oh. on those topics. Very yeah. happy to do so. I mean, that's a whole other kettle of fish. And, of course, the more important one, really. Of course. I mean, import, it is definitely the most important thing. But uh, what we talked uh, for this hour and a half, I think it was excellent. And for the... For getting to know you for the first time like that, it was um, was really good for me. I hope that the talk was uh, okay for you as well. Oh, absolutely. I, uh, you know, one of the great things about living here in Austria, and I, I hope the borders will open sooner rather than later, has been the chance to explore Central Europe. Yeah, I can imagine. It's. I've. Uh, I'm afraid I've only been through Slovenia thus far on my way to Zagreb. Yeah. But, oh, yeah, it took the bus, in fact. But uh, I went through, and I'm, I'm very curious about Slovenia because I have a lot of friends in Croatia. I have a lot of friends in Hungary, and Czechia, in Slovakia, and Austria, of course. And but none in Slovenia. None in Slovenia. Well, Until now. Yeah, well, I, I, that's a, a, quite a huge honor for me to kind of be your first Slovenian friend if I may say so. So that's that's a huge thing. And when you visit Slovenia, you'll see it's quite different than all the countries you you stated. It, 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 it looked different from the bus, I can tell you that. Uh, from what I could see, it, it, as soon as you cross the border from Austria, it's very different. And you went up the, 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 the northern region from yeah. there? To, yeah. I, it, I took the bus from uh, Vienna down through Graz. Yeah. Uh, through, uh, I guess, to Ljubljana. Yeah. Oh, you went and, to Ljubljana and through went, Ljubljana it, and, and then to Zagreb. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, went, it, went, it went around the, uh, the outskirts of Ljubljana, of course. It didn't go through the center, which I'd love to see. So you, uh, you saw something from the wind. Yeah. From the wind of the bus. Yeah. That's been, my, uh, that's been my entire experience of Slovenia. Uh, but, you know, I've, I've, since I've been here, I've been to, uh, I've been to Krakow. I've been to uh, uh, Prague. Uh, I've been out to Tirnava in Slovakia. I've been to Zagreb. I've, uh, now, years ago, I went to uh, Temeshwara, Temeshvar in the Banat in Romania. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's funny. All these countries are different from each other in one way. But you can also see the similarities. Oh, you, you can see they were part of this magnificent empire. That Oh, oh yeah. It's, and it was funny. Bucharest was, because uh, I was on a lecture tour of Romania back in 99, and that's when I saw uh, Timisoara. But Bucharest and Timisoara, Bucharest is a bit like a poor man's Paris, 
and Timisvara <laughs> like a poor man's Vienna. <laughs> well, you know, for Prague, they said it was this, it was a second Vienna and stuff like that. So uh, I ha well, haven't you know, been there. You know, but, the joke, yeah. the the joke my friends in Zagreb told me is that if you measure Zagreb against the rest of Central Europe, then it's you know whether it's uh, the hospitals, or the ballet, or anything you like, it's always number four, or number five. Okay. But you compare it to the rest of the Balkans. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I w don't I won't go there because Slovenia is. There could be all another joke to that. So yeah. So, uh, Slovenia is it's Slovenia is about as Balkan as Sagan. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're not. No. We're not. It, and I hope you will see that one day that you will visit us, and. Uh, I don't know what to expect more sooner to talk to you again or for you yeah. to come to visit well, us. So, well, I'd I'd uh, I, I'll look forward to both, but uh, the sooner the sooner that I'm able to travel again, the happier I'll be. Yeah, I think that would be I, better. Uh, it it uh, mind you, I, I I'm in very pleasant surroundings. I have the sacraments regularly, which most people don't have, so I'm very no, grateful. Now, now you you told it. What's that? You you tell you tell that to the public. So now we're we're all curious. <laughs> oh well, there's, uh, there's nothing nothing particularly special about it. I mean, if you're if you're locked up in a uh, if you're locked up in a religious institution, there are priests ah, and there are private masses. You're blessed men. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. I uh, I mean, it's like my uh, my nephew uh, my nephew's seminary in L.A. has been completely under lockdown for a month and a half or whatever. Of course, they have masses every day. It's a seminary. Perfect. They've got all their professors there. That's so awesome. Here, they sent most of the students home mm. uh, to America or to wherever they came from. It was a little bit funny. I, 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 I don't want to overstay my welcome, but it was a little bit interesting here because I was um, wrestling with going home. Hmm. But I'm turning 60 this year, and to have gotten home would have meant two air flights crammed into a plane and if anybody had the virus i'd have been exposed and then when i'd arrived at lax i would have been crammed into a small room waiting to be tested for it hmm. with a bunch of other people <laughs> and then when i arrived uh i'd have to spend two weeks in quarantine i mean strict quarantine in my room uh and then if i did get it i have no insurance in california I have insurance here. So it would have been very bad. And the funny thing was, I was uh, approaching the administration. I was on my way to, to see them, asking to be allowed to stay as one of the, they, they had exceptions, you say. I was about to ask to be put on the exceptions list. And the administrator bumped into me and he said, you know, Mr. Coulomb, we were thinking about this. And here's the problem. You'd have to take two planes to get home. You're turning 60 this year. Uh, you'd have to wait at LAX and go through all the, you know, cram with all these people and go through the testing. Then you'd have two weeks of quarantine. <laughs> and we don't think you've got insurance home at home. <laughs> and so we were thinking you'd probably be smarter if you stayed here. And you're, you're at the very head of the exemptions list. <laughs> okay. Was it sort of inception? So, yeah, it wasn't, it, it wasn't too hard. And I'm I'm really grateful. I mean, not just for the sacraments, obviously, but I'm grateful to be here because I, I love Central Europe. I can I imagine. Love, uh, I can imagine. It's yeah. and to be honest with you, had I gone home, who knows when I'd be able to come back? Yeah, especially in California. Yeah. No offense. I, I mean, no offense. It's a joke. <laughs> no, it, it's listen. The, the things are not good at home right now. I mean, they're all they're all right in my home, but they're not good in LA. Um, they're not good at all, and I'm I'm very I'm not worried for most of my friends and family, but I'm just as happy to miss out on it. Yeah, I can imagine. Well, sir, it was really really an honor to having you as my first foreign host, and especially that being you. I think it was very very fruitful talk, and I do hope we talk again as soon as possible. Whatever you like. Thank you. I'm I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you very much. I hope that we will travel as soon as possible. But yeah. 
so you and me both have a lovely day you and me both. Uh, it was really a pleasure hosting you maybe if we would you like to have some final words for our listeners um yeah i i sure would um i would just say this as i i began to, i began to mention it before i'll say it again you and central europe are very very fortunate in the sense that you have seen the kind of drivel that our leadership in the West is trying to push and have pushed successfully. Hmm. You saw it under communism. What I would hope to see are the nations of Central Europe coming together once more and acting initially as a counterweight to France and Germany Hmm. and eventually as an inspiration to them. As an inspiration to them. And from that, I hope to see a Europe that will serve as an inspiration to the Europe beyond the seas. Uh, America, the Latin countries, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, the settler countries. Because you see, what people forget is that we're European too. Yeah. We didn't come out of nowhere. <laughs> and the health of the old continent is very important to the rest of us, whether we know it or not. I'll leave you with this last thought from uh, Otto von Habsburg. He said that really the boundaries of Europe, and remember he's saying this during the communist days, really the boundaries of Europe extend from San Francisco to Vladivostok, (laughs) even if at the moment there are a lot more who would like to see them extend from Vladivostok to San Francisco. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I hope times do change. So, uh, please God, sir. Thank you again for taking your time and uh, have a blessed day. And to our listeners, uh, I hope you enjoyed what uh, we produced here. Uh, do not forget to su- subscribe. I will do have more uh, of foreign hosts and uh, shows in English language as well. Have a blessed day and uh, Godspeed. <laughs>